Yo, 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 you know what it is. It's your boy Baki back with another review, baby. Let's get it. All right, so this time we're going to be talking about Blade 2, uh, the sequel to Blade. Now, if you want to find out a little bit about the backstory of Blade, uh, feel free to watch my first review about Blade. This is just going to dive right into it because we got a lot to talk about, okay? Blade 2 is just as good as the first movie. It does things better and it does things worse, but overall, it's still a great fun watch all the way through. Um, the basic premise of this blade is Whistler didn't die at the end of the first movie or at, in the middle of the first movie. Uh, he instead was captured and they took him to, uh, random places and turned him into a vampire. And then they just beat the shit out of him and put him in a vat of blood and heal him all the time. But anyways, Wesley blade is looking for Whistler. And he's been searching for him for years and you open on the very beginning of the movie and he's getting information to try to find out where Whistler is. Now, the opening of this movie is very strong, but nowhere near as strong as the opening to the original Blade. And to me, that's kind of how the whole movie is. It stands up to Blade, but to me, Blade is just a little bit higher. Um, So he finds Whistler and then uh, he comes, takes Whistler back home. You meet Scud, who is Daryl. And uh, basically, the movie starts right there. That's where the real premise of the movie starts. You have two vampires who invade Wesley's base of operations, and they go in. They really just want to have a conversation with him. I don't know why they knock on the front door, but they want to have a conversation with Blade, and you find out that the vampires want a truce, so to speak. And they want this truce because there is another predator that is out hunting uh vampires and it's called the reaper and you see a little bit of the reaper with nomak at the very beginning of the movie now what i love about this movie is the visual effects have been done 10 times better than in the original blade you've had a couple years in between and the vampires when they disintegrate looks amazing um the thing that doesn't hold up well is the cg now I know a lot of people don't like the CG, and I really don't either. I personally prefer the original Blade because it kind of shies away from the CG. But I will say that what the CG does in this movie is it makes Blade's powers seem powerful. He seems like a superhero. He does things in this movie that he didn't do in the original Blade at all, and he was more grounded there. But here, he really seems like a fucking vampire with superpowers. He jumps out of windows and dual wields out. He uh, jumps off of walls to wall kick. He double kicks people in the air. He does all these things that have CG moments, but it helps define Blade a little bit more than you would with without that. If you think about it in the first movie, the only real superpower shit he did was he did that jump leap at the very end of the movie into the middle of the fucking uh, arena. He did that throw where he threw Karen across the building. He jumped across the building. He grabbed the subway, uh, the, the end of the subway where he dislocated his arm. That, that's about it, really, um, when it comes to Blade's superpowers in the first movie. But in this one, you definitely feel like Blade is stronger and you feel like he... Uh, has been honing his powers even more than what he was doing in the first movie. Um, so you get to this point in the middle of the movie where the vampires have now welcomed Blade inside and Blade has agreed to come inside to see the vampire's world. So you meet the Blood Pack. The Blood Pack is the team that teams up with Blade uh, to go handle these Reapers. And the Blood Pack was originally trained to fight Blade. So when they see Blade, there's a little bit of tension there, and it's it's good tension. It's like they don't really fuck with him, but they kind of have to right now because their bosses are telling them so, you know? And it gives you this really cool dynamic of almost a fish out of water, but Blade, he knows about the vampire world. So he's not really a fish out of water as much as a fish in a different pool or a different lake, if you will. You see what I'm saying? He still knows the elements, but he has to navigate it differently now because it's a different ball game. Um, so the Blood Pack and Blade 
and Whistler and everybody go all uh, to this place called the House of Pain to go um, search for these uh, Reapers because they knew that the Reapers were going to attack uh, one of the vampires like big hideouts, if you will. Now, what what sticks out to me in this movie is everything is visual. When you step into the House of Pain, you see all of these utensils and everything on the sides of these mechan or these medical equipment where there's saws and scalpels and all these things where they're pretty much tearing up humans and feeding on them in this vampire bar, if you will. Um, what I don't like about Blade 2 is that exact same thing is the visuals sometimes because they do more with their eyes than they do with the dialogue. See, in the first Blade, there was just little snippets of dialogue that kept you hooked in to be like, ooh, is that how that is? Ooh, is that what that is? But in here, there really is none of that. Everything that is said is said for a reason, either exposition or it's just dialogue or whatever it is. But it's never just to like explore lore or go a little further, if you will. Um, so Blade and fucking all the people in the are in the house of pain and you just like i said you just see the vampire's world and the reapers are underneath ready to come up above this to me is one of the best scenes in the entire movie uh because it's it's a twist on the nightclub scene that already happened in the first movie right instead of blade going in there to waste a bunch of fucking vampires he's there to fuck up some reapers and kind of watch some other vampires backs if you will and there's actually a part in the fucking movie where the vampires are shooting other vampires because the Reapers are so fast. They're just hitting people in the crossfire. So it's a really interesting dynamic to have Blade not really dig into the norm that is Blade, you know. So you get past all of that and you get to uh, you get to find out that Nomad essentially uh, or I'm sorry, Nomad essentially was created from his father i forgot his name it's like something with a d i'll put it up somewhere here um but he was created by his father and his father genetically created him because he's trying to eliminate all of vampire's weaknesses he's trying to get rid of the silver the fucking the steaks the fucking garlic he's trying to eliminate the daylight he's trying to eliminate all of these things so that the race of vampires can succeed and not be so uh relegated to the shadows all the time and Nomak is basically the first failure of his father, if you will. And he keeps creating these genes. Now, I don't want to get like too crazy into the plot. Um, after that, they do a nice sewer scene, which is probably my second favorite scene in the whole entire movie. And there's just tons of Reapers around. But the one thing I want to talk about during the sewer scene is uh, Whistler has to team up with two other vampires. He's got to team up with Reinhardt. I didn't know his name was Reinhardt, which is funny because I play a shit ton of Overwatch. And he's got to team up with, um, I don't know the other dude's name. I want to say it's Chopa or Chupa or something like that. But they already have a plan to fuck up Whistler because during the House of Pain scene, they lost one of theirs. Uh, his name was Priest. And he got fucking turned into a Reaper and they basically had to off him in front of uh, everyone else in the group which is I imagine would be pretty hard because you've probably been growing with this person for years and learning their ins and outs about them. And then you just see them die. So that sucks. So now you feel a certain way towards Blade and everything. So you want to fuck up Whistler. Um, so they try real hard to fuck up Whistler. They beat the shit out of him. Uh, Reinhardt, who's Ron Perlman, leaves the situation and just leaves uh, Chopa and uh, Whistler to it. And they're just fighting and shit. Whistler activates the pheromones, which adds more Reapers to the situation. Um, then you have one of the coolest scenes in the entire movie, which is, uh, Ron Perlman is trying to fix the, he's trying to fix this lever on this grenade bomb that they've created because the only thing that Reapers are weak to is light. They're not weak to silver. They're not weak to anything that normal vampires are weak to except for daylight. So they all have UV lights on their, uh, on their guns and you can flip it off flip it on with a little with a little uh light lid now um the coolest scene in the movie to me is blade has to go back to go activate that bomb because ron perlman couldn't get it activated or whatever he was trying to activate it and he couldn't do it so he left it there 
Blade goes back to do it, and uh, Ron Perlman's character Reinhardt forgets to tell him on purpose, obviously, that the lever was stuck. So Blade is up there shooting, 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 does what he does, and he breaks the lever down. And then this crazy big uh, ultraviolet explosion just happens, and it just permeates through the entire sewers and even hits uh, Nisa, who is the um, who is Nomak's sister, if you will, half sister technically. I would guess you would call it because I mean, obviously, she's not the same like full race. She's not a full Reaper, so so Nisa and Reinhardt even get burned by this ultraviolet rays. And then right when that happens, Blade is taken uh, down pretty much by soldiers because it's all been a plot from the beginning that blade was really who they were after so they kind of used they were they were originally trying to create nomak to do to become this new version of vampire right but it didn't work out it failed nomak escaped he's doing what he's doing so they use that idea as a premise for blade to be able to come into their world and not fucking kill everybody because he has a new enemy for them to fight. But their plan all along was to get the Daywalker and pretty much do the exact same thing that Deacon was trying to do in the first movie. Just with all the vampires instead of just one vampire. Instead of him becoming Blood God, they're trying to make everybody that's not not the vampires that are created now, but all the future vampires will be immune to sunlight and silver and garlic and blah, blah, blah. So you have a really cool dynamic that kind of rehashes back on that first idea, like like Blade is the key. Because technically he is. He's the one person that is like an anomaly in the vampire world where he was born as she was being turned and, you know, genetics and everything else is just kind of mixed together and created Blade. So in a sense, they're right when they when that's what they're going after. What takes me out of the movie a bit is it's almost the exact same uh, set of events in the third act, right? You have Wesley getting captured. Happens in the first movie, right? Then after Wesley gets captured, they drain his blood. But instead of draining his blood in this one, they put him on this uh, spike uh, gurney. It's got spikes that poke out and they fucking permeate through his arms and his legs, which doesn't do anything through his chest, but his arms and his legs all got these fat spikes. I mean, these, sp these spikes is fat, bro. They all got these fat spikes in them, and they're, like, planted down. So now Blade is, like, weak, and he's on he's on his last leg, if you will. But that's the exact same thing that happened in the first movie. Now, in the first movie, Karen uh, gives Blade blood so she can... Uh, so, so, I'm sorry. Karen gives Blade blood so he can... Uh, be strong enough to handle Deacon Frost. In this movie, uh, Whistler actually saves Blade, which I think was pretty cool. Whistler saves Blade, and when Whistler saves Blade, he takes Blade and carries him to this vat of blood uh, where they were all talking before, where they blew up Scud. Now, to me, this is like one of the lamer parts of the movie because I have so many questions, it's not even funny. In the first movie, they just slit Blade's wrist. So you would think that that kind of heal for a vampire would be pretty quick and wouldn't really have any problems. These are like prongs going through your arms, bro, which means they're probably going to penetrate some bone of some kind and cause you some kind of issues. Now, granted, in the first movie, you saw, um, I think his name is Glenn. You saw him get his, his arm chopped off two different times, and literally the next time you saw him, he had new hands. But he, it, what it seems like is he had to cut somebody else's hand off and then he put that hand on him you know and then that hand grew and adapted and then it finally became normal again so uh whistler and blade are going to this vat of blood and they just uh whistler falls as ron perlman's character reinhardt is shooting at him with his shotgun douche 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 he shoots him with the last shots and blade falls into the pool of blood ron perlman walks away blade emerges already ready and in that sense, again, I'm like, how much blood was he drinking down there? What what really happened in that sense where you went down, would you drink some blood and that instantly, instantly recovered your shit? Because even in this movie, uh, when Ron Perlman and Nyssa are both burned, they're still healing in these scenes. And theirs were only burn marks. Granted, it was from daylight, which is probably their greatest weakness, but still... um. 
they're still healing. So like one of the things that kind of took me out this time watching it was when he just stood up and he had these holes in his legs, but they weren't, they're all healed. Everything's all healed up. He was perfectly fine after spending not even a full 15 seconds in the pool where when he was drinking from Karen, he was up there. They cut to that scene 16 different times where she said, keep going, keep going, keep going. She kept, she kept saying, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop, you know? telling you that he's taking a lot of fucking blood right now. And that was kind of his first time getting real blood in a long time. So it like amps him up. Uh, then you have this awesome scene between Reinhardt and uh, I'm sorry. You have this awesome scene between Blade and Reinhardt's like uh, entourage of enemies, if you will. Uh, Blade whoops all types of ass, fin finishes it with an awesome uh, like suplex and then stands up to fight uh, Reinhardt. Now, here is something I want to talk about, too. Earlier in the movie, when Blade first meets the Blood Pack, Reinhardt and Blade kind of have a little face off. And the first thing Reinhardt says to Blade is, can you blush? Now, I talked to my friends about this shit uh, a long ass time ago, but we all pretty much came to the assumption that that was like a racist comment. You know what I mean? Because like black people can't technically blush or whatever the hell you want to call it. Um, So... Anyways, at the at the end, when Ron Perlman and Blade are fighting, uh, Reinhardt tries to catch him with this blade. Blade catches it. Blade catches the blade. Blade catches the blade, and when he uh, before he deflects it to kill uh, Reinhardt, he says, "Can you blush?" And then he cuts him. And I thought that was a really cool uh, line that they had in that movie. Um, then you cut to uh, Nomak, who's been let inside by Blade. Um, during the sewer scene, when Whistler is fighting uh, Chupo or whatever his name is, Nomad catches up with Whistler and basically reveals everything and tells him that he is the son of, I'm just going to call him Demetrius, and um, that he was made this way and everything else. So Blade and Whistler learn the truth and they kind of give the whereabouts to the secret location to Nomad. Now, Nomad's inside causing all types of hell. If you think about it, it's really cool because Nomak is basically doing what Blade had to do in the first movie, if you will, kind of like break through all of these enemies. And he is just tearing up everything, bro. Nomak's scenes are always cool in this movie. I love him as a character. I love him as a villain. Um, you fast forward, he breaks through all of the enemies and he gets to his father. His father was planning on escaping through a helicopter, but his, his daughter has learned all these things too. And she's come to the revelation that her dad is a fucking asshole. So she locks him inside the building and he gives one of the craziest lines uh, where he just like yells at her. And I thought like when I saw this again, I was just like, you can actually see the levels of, of scheming this guy is doing, right? He's got this extra level of scheming where he's, he's literally trying to tell you, um, I, I'm innocent and these these reapers were created out of this secret gene and then he's got another side where he's trying to persuade Blade he's got another side where he's trying to persuade his daughter and when Nomak comes at the end he even tries to persuade Nomak but Nomak doesn't fall for any of that shit and um, I actually like the, the little interaction between those two um, you fast forward uh, Nomak kills his father and then he bites Nisa um, with uh, the Reaper bite, so she's going to turn into a Reaper. Blade comes in, and then you have a Nomak Blade fight. Now, the Nomak Blade fight is 10 million times doper than the Deacon Blade fight in the first movie. You just have so much more, like I said, super powerness happen. It's to the point where uh, Blade is jumping off of walls, and Nomak's jump climbing up walls, and elbowing blade down after a, an 18 foot drop and swinging him through uh pillars like it's a really really good fight with a lot of dynamic swaps um blade's katana is broken and he ends up shoving it into the heart of nomak nomak ends up finishing the job himself um nisa's been bitten by the reapers she wants to be a vampire um she wants to die as a vampire excuse me and so uh Blade takes her out into the uh, into the uh, takes her outside so she can die to her first uh, sunrise ever. 
uh, you pretty much are done there. Roll credits. Now, after that little synopsis, um, let me just say a few things about what I really, really liked and what I wish they would have did more. All of the choreography in this in this movie is really well done, but they have jump cuts all over the place. So I love the fighting, but I just wish that the CG wasn't the only thing they never cut from. Whenever there's a CG moment in the movie, they don't cut from it. But if there's a non-CG moment, they do three or four weird cuts for no reason when you could have just had it as a one take and it would have looked so much more badass than five quick chops like it's taken and he's hitting a fence, you know? Overall, I still say Blade is a higher movie though because the opening scene tells you so much more about the world of Blade than this opening scene. This opening scene, he's hunting Whistler, which again, doesn't really make sense. If you think about it, at the at, in the middle of the first movie, he hands Whistler the gun and walks away. You hear a gunshot, the gun drops, there's got to be a Whistler body or something for Blade to have to take care of tomorrow. Otherwise, this shit's going to stink. Like, what happened? Did, 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 Blade, did Blade walk away and then, like, go meditate and then he left and then vampires came and took Whistler then? Like, it just doesn't make sense to how Whistler got captured in the first place. In my opinion... Um, even though I love Whistler in the second movie, I think the movie would have been a lot stronger if you didn't have Whistler at all. You could have made you could have just made another character instead of Whistler. Whistler's death was super impactful in the first movie. And by negating that and saying that it didn't happen kind of takes away from the first movie a bit watching this movie. It kind of makes you feel like like those Saw movies where they just keep adding extra shit on top afterwards after the fact um i'm trying to think of what else really was awesome the weapons i love the weapons in this movie uh blade has this like chargeable blade uh these like hand blades that he can just like punch and it loads like silver nitrate into a cartridge and fucks people up and he fucking hits uh nomak with it in this awesome fight scene in the house of pain uh in like this cathedral part of the house of pain and it's a really, really cool fight scene in general. They get down, they scrap. And a lot of the weapons that Blade uses in this movie um, hit really hard. He's still using a lot of traditionals. He's got that little blade thing he throws. Still got his guns, you know. But the little things that they add uh, make this movie uh, pretty impactful. Like I said, I'd still put it a notch below Blade. But it still has a an arguably a better act, a better third act than Blade than the original Blade movie. See, the original Blade movie, even in my review, I say this, the lead up to Deacon Frost is awesome. But then you get to the Blade fight between Deacon Frost and Blade, and it's like two minutes long. There's really no impactful moment in that shit. Deacon hits this crazy jump, and then he's loaded with bull with uh, with all these, you know, uh, needles uh, moments after. Whereas in, 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 in Blade 2, you get this crazy lead up to Nomak and Blade fighting to where you almost thought they could be they could be friends, you know, like they both want vampires dead in a sense, you know. But, you know, Reaper, uh, I'm sorry, Nomak's already taken care of Nyssa, which was his sister. And so Blade sees that, flips out, jumps out and impales him right then and then boom, begin fight. And now that whole third act was awesome leading up to it. Uh, the things that don't resonate well for me is, like I said, the Whistler storyline. You could just completely tarnish that, put somebody else in there, and then it would actually be stronger. Um, and just the fact that they didn't really explore lore or anything in this movie. There's a there's a big ass pool of blood in the middle of this room, and you're like, why is this here? <laughs> like, I don't know why that pool of blood is even in the fucking room. You don't understand half of the things that you're looking at. There's a part when you walk into the House of Pain and they're like cutting these people's backs. And I'm like, like, what is going on there? Are they gonna eat that skin? Like, I just don't understand a lot of the lore that they're trying to show you visually because there's no dialogue about it. You know, I need that dialogue to help me understand what I'm looking at a bit, you know? I And it, it's crazy because they even make a line like, well, we wanna see what their world is like. And you really don't, 
get to see what the vampire's world is like necessarily. You just get to see two locations. One location, really. Well, no, I guess it's two locations. You can see the main headquarters location and then you can see the House of Pain. Um, so I wish that they would have uh, went a little further into the lore development and got you asking questions after the movie. Because there's nothing to really ask here. This movie is extremely straightforward, which is okay, but it doesn't leave you uh, thinking like the original Blade movie does. The original Blade movie will have you pondering for a little bit afterwards, just questioning like what's next, what's on the next horizon for Blade, like what is this, what is that? And you don't really have that here. In fact, when this movie ends, it ends with Blade killing the first dude that he encountered at the beginning of the movie, which just was some random ass guy that he sees again in the House of Pain. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't resonate as strong. Um, and you can already see that this franchise is starting to slowly decline its way down. Now, when we get to Trinity, it's going to be a whole nother ball game. But um, that was my overall impressions of Blade 2. A great, fun uh, movie with tons of great actors, tons of great moments, but falls a little flat when it comes to lore development, an actual legit plot line. And that's about it. Um, this one's gone on a little bit too longer than I thought, guys. I'm going to try to chop it up as much as I can. But that was my review of Blade 2. Again, it's a great movie. It's got highs and lows. Not really lows. I'd say it's got highs and mids. And um, But to me, it just doesn't hold a candle to the first movie. But it's pretty close. So I hope you guys enjoyed uh, your boy's review of Blade 2. I hope to see you guys on the next one. Thank you so much for kicking it with your boy. Peace.